It's Friday, it's four o'clock, which means it's time for Truth Loader Investigates Live. Coming up on today's show, The Walking Dead. Plenty of examples of parasites, bacteria and viruses that can actually alter uh, their host's behaviour. Saving lives. This is made of nanoparticles that are able to bind oxygen and give them off, just like real blood can do. And making your fortune from YouTube. We have millions of partners on YouTube and thousands are making six figure. So, we've got quite a lineup today. Sounds exciting. Sounds exciting. Do you want to know about zombies? I do. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you do. Do you want to know how to become a millionaire on YouTube? I do. Well, this is the show for you then. Excellent. Right Mexico. place. Friday, four o'clock. I'm Sam. This is Adam. Hello. And we'll be taking you through the weird and wonderful world of science, technology, conspiracy theories, and all kinds of nonsense in between with a bit of banter and other things. Today, for the first time ever, a Truth Loader investigates first. We have a live guest coming in. We've got James Pope, who worked on the Bionic, Bionic Man Even project. And he's going to be taking your questions and hopefully giving us some answers. So he'll be joining us a little later in the show. So if you do have any questions for him, please do comment and uh, we'll put those to him. Sensible questions only, please. <laughs> yeah. There are certain parts we do not want to bionically replace <laughs> just yet. Which ones? <laughs> We'd better not go into that. My heart. <laughs> Anyway, let's get go on that note. Oh, good. <laughs> 45 seconds and we've already descended to those depths. <laughs> First up, could zombies really exist? What do you reckon? I don't know. Shall we find out, Sam? Let's find out. We spoke to a scientist and zombie fanatic, Andrew Voke, who uh, gave us his opinion. Reanimated corpses, that's very unlikely. However, drastically altering uh, behaviour, that's much more in line with stuff that we see in nature. There's in fact actually like plenty, <coughs> plenty of examples of parasites, um, uh, bacteria and viruses that can actually alter uh, their host's behaviour. 28 days later and 28 weeks later, that virus, well at least its symptoms, were based upon rabies, making this uh, leap from something that can have debilitating changes in host behaviour to something that, yeah, kind of is then likened to, say, for example, 28 days later. It's not impossible, but I would say very, very unlikely. So zombies aren't impossible. Zombies are not impossible. How scary is that? That's terrifying. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. But what he said, it's unlikely for a 28 days later scenario. It is unlikely, but you've got to remember, rabies is, is a disease that exists already. It's out there, it infects people, and it can turn them incredibly aggressive and violent. What I, I was speaking to Andrew earlier this week, and he said that the, the leap that people make that isn't quite right and isn't quite fair is assuming that it would be very easy for a virus to evolve or develop based on rabies that really wants to infect everything and wants to spread around the world like a parasite. He said that people think that that can happen overnight and it would take thousands and thousands of years. So it's, not, it's not going to wipe out an entire country like it does in the films like 28 days later or 28 weeks later when it's, it suddenly goes mm. in, you get infected with rage <laughs> and then everybody's dead. Or well, dead. apparently not, but it's just that kind of thinking that got us into that trouble in the first place <laughs> if we prepared for the rage. <laughs> Robert Carlyle would never have eaten his family. Well. Hang on, if he could have just controlled his urges, he went in and kissed his wife he when he was it. told specifically not to do that. Nobody told Robert Carlyle what to do. Well, if somebody, him somebody nicely, should have done and <laughs> everything would have been fine. But there are all kinds of these parasites and, and mind-controlling bugs that exist in nature. I mean, there's one that's, uh, that tackles bees, there's a wasp that lays its eggs inside a certain caterpillar and then the, they eat the caterpillar but the caterpillar is just alive enough for them to take over its brain and spin a cocoon of silk to protect the wasp eggs, yeah. which is pretty horrible. Yeah. But there's at least one out there that can really actually mess with our people's minds already. Yes, uh, that's uh, Toxoplasma gondii. Uh, yeah, mice and uh, other rodents, they're kind of hardwired to uh, avoid cats, right, for obvious reasons. However, uh, mice that have been infected with, yeah, this parasite, that, that fear will be completely switched off. In fact, actually, like, uh, some of the rodents, in fact, will actually be attracted to um, the smell of um, uh, cat urine, the smell of cats. The reason for this is that the parasite, once the, the mouse has been eaten by the cat, that then starts the kind of the next stage of the life cycle of this parasite. So it's purely within the best interest of the parasite itself to be eaten by a cat. 
there is a research that shows that this could also slightly affect human behaviour. One uh, particular scientist, um, uh, he has theorised that actually uh, if um, we were to screen for this parasite, that possibly we would be able to um, save a few car crashes, kind of extrapolating from uh, his research saying that, yeah, a lot of people involved in car crashes are infected by this parasite and that possibly they're a little bit kind of less risk aware so are more likely to, t you know, do a tricky overtake or something like that and cause a car crash. There's even some evidence to say that there's a link between this parasite and things like um, acute depression, schizophrenia, even suicide. So when I've been crashed into in my car, not, not having a car <laughs> crash myself, I have been crashed into, this is important, that person could have been a zombie. Yes. Right. Fact. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to tell people that next time I bring up the fact that I had a car crash, I was hit by a zombie. There you go. <laughs> I fortunately have never had a car crash, touch wood, and so therefore, and clearly, Tasmaplex and Lagondi free. <laughs> that impossible word. To, why is it science words are so difficult to say? Because what they did, they started with big animals, like animals that you see, and they had easy names. Dog. Cat. <laughs> person and by the time they discovered new smaller things they'd run out of easy to say names <laughs> and they just strung together random is, scrabble is combinations. That a true fact? <laughs> Absolute <laughs> fact. In fact Tasmapax are gone to die to lipo is a, a 275 letter score in Scrabble. Utter lies. I have no idea if that's true or not. No it's not. You can't use more than seven letters at a time in Scrabble anyway so you yeah. Today I learned. Anyway, moving on, because we're about to start talking about the Bionic Man, so we'll have a lovely young gentleman by the name of James Pope joining us. If you have any questions for him about bionics, about replacing human organs with machine parts and what's possible and what we're going to be able to do in the future, please do get in contact because we'll be putting your questions to him. But, right, the, the way this has come about, is there's a documentary that's been put together. Channel 4 have put together a documentary called How to Build a Bionic Man, where they've made a robot out of the most advanced medical parts in the world. Um, we can see him here. Check out this real-life million-dollar man. Because this gentleman costs £640,000 for a million dollars. He has a trachea, heart, kidney, entire blood system, fingers, legs, feet, everything. This man, so he could function and walk about and pick things up and or, or not. Well, with a human attached, yes. I mean, it would take a very unlucky human to need <laughs> all of that at once. <laughs> You'd have to have a pretty serious car accident. You'd have to have a serious case of taxamaplasm and gone die. <laughs> yes, <laughs> got it. Uh, but I mean, he's got ears, he's got working eyes. Everything in there is fully functional and it is the most groundbreaking medical advances available to mankind. And they spent a million dollars on it, so he is the million dollar he is the real life bionic man. Re million dollar bionic man. And he's on display at the Science Museum in London at the moment. The documentary, it was a Channel 4 documentary, we should probably plug it a little bit since they made it. Uh, it went out yesterday, I'm sure you can still catch it if you're in the UK online. If not, then it might be going out internationally. But this machine is on display at the Science Museum. How long is it the there moment. for? Uh, do you know what, I'm not entirely okay. sure. We will let you know. And we will put a little comment down below. So if you do want to go and see it, then you'll know. It does when look you cool. Can. It I'd does look cool. It, yeah. yeah. Just it, how how I don't know. How, does it? So does it pump blood? Yeah. Well, does actually, it? we can ask the man himself because James has just entered the hangout. Hi, James. Are you there? Can you hear us? Hi. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Uh, like, okay. No. Uh, we're going to try and get James. Sorry, is, did, I, we can see James. We can't quite hear James yet. Ah, there he is. Hi, James. Can you hear us? Hi, I can hear you perfectly, but I can't see. James, is your microphone uh, muted at the top of your top of your screen? I I expect so. I'm not Hi. used to. Hi. You, you can hear us, James, but we can't hear you. Yeah. Yes. Try top top uh, right of your screen. There should be a microphone symbol. Uh, anyway, top. whilst we sort out this minor technical hitch, <laughs> we're going to carry on talking about the bionic man. There's James. No, he's gone. There's James. Do that? No, he, no, he's gone. Right, anyway. Smooth. <laughs> what we'll do, we'll play another little bit of video. Uh, basically, this uh, this robot was modelled on the presenter of the show, a guy called Bert Bertolt Mayer. He's a Swiss social psychologist. And uh, he talked us through, we were talking about the blood there, he talked us through the blood, which is his favourite part of the machine. One of my personal favourites is the artificial blood that runs through these tubings. And 
because this is made of nano particles that are able to I can see them off. here, but they can't hear me. Give them off, just what? like real blood. I can hear them and see them, but they can't but hear this me. this is not a real blood, this is nano particles. Mm. And I thought that was absolutely can't he? No. It's not particle blood. Yeah. It's plastic, plastic blood. <laughs> and they can do this, and they can put this in people, I think. They're all ready. And it's amazing. I mean, what they were saying in the documentary is that the main problem with this stuff is that actually... It, it all exists, but it's so expensive, £640,000 for the full set, if you should want to collect it. Um, and insurance companies just won't pay for it. I mean, that was one of the things that came out of yeah, this documentary. So the stuff is there, it's just... Is there a high, is there I, remember, a high I remember there was, a, there was a kid a few years ago who needed a bionic arm, and it cost something like $200,000 Yeah, And I think, I think in the end, Mercedes... <laughs> I think they paid for it because he was a big racing fan. Amazing. I'm fairly sure that's true. Fantastic. Well, I mean, that's that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Two hundred thousand pounds for a bionic arm. I mean, my dad actually um, a bit of personal history here. Tiny violins. My dad <laughs> had a false leg. He lost his leg in a motorbike accident when he was uh, when he was really young. And, uh, yes, it is bad. <laughs> and uh, and he had a false leg. And at the time, you know, technology was such that it was all he had was a, a small plastic plastic thing and now you can have these legs which are actually robotic legs that connect to your brain and you can walk on these legs and just the way the technology moves on is astonishing and Bertolt the guy who presents the documentary has a prosthetic hand and it can grip it can reach out touch pick things up pick can, things up yeah can he sense things in it though I don't, you know what, I don't know I don't think so that would be unbelievable if you could if you could recreate the nerves in mm. some way you yeah Maybe we could look into this. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. In a few weeks ago, we, I think we mentioned this every week so far, we interviewed Professor Kevin Warwick, who's a leader in cybernetics, and he is kind of working on this stuff right now, and he reckons it's doable. He, he reckons that we'll have this stuff in a couple of years, but it's the money. We seem to have lost we James Pope. We seem to have lost James Pope. We will put your questions to him if we can get him back. I think he's uh, had some minor technical problems possibly with a microphone, <laughs> since we couldn't hear him, but we will come back to him. So we're going to move on swiftly, but we will come back to James if we can. So, next up, do you want to be a millionaire? Yes, I do. <laughs> do I have to go on TV and be questioned by Chris Tarrant, though? Because I don't want no. to do that. No, you don't have to do that, nor do you have to ruin the economy and then claim huge bonuses, <laughs> bankers, <laughs> because there is an easier way. Well, it's not an easy way, actually. It, yeah, it's, no, a, it's, it's quite a lot way. of work still. <laughs> oh, I said that just disregarding everyone's efforts. Anyway, YouTube is a genuine way now that you can run a business and you can earn a very good income off it. There are people out there who are celebrities. They're millionaires. But do you at home want to be one of those people? Perhaps you have a great idea, but you don't know how to put it forward, how to get people watching your idea. We're here to help because David Ripper is from YouTube and he, when we spoke to him earlier this week, gave us some tips for success. So if you want to follow it, do this. What's really important is really talk about something that you're passionate about, obviously. So it's creating content that you know about, that you're passionate about, um, that your audience is going to care about. Collaborate with other YouTubers that are already successful on the platform and we can help you with that. So finding someone that you can collaborate on and do a piece of music for your video and link back to each other. Uh, we're all about subscriptions here, right? So we want to have people discover your, your channel, subscribe to your channel, uh, so they can be up to date with the new videos that you post. Annotations are little pieces of text or image on your video that people can click on. So you can call, call for actions. You can ask people to subscribe to the channel, look at the analytics that are at your disposal when you're a partner. You can see you know, where people drop off or not during the video, what part was the most successful, uh, where are the peaks and valleys in terms of views and subscribers, so this is our playbook. This is a, a Bible that we've de developed that gives you all the tips to develop audience on YouTube. Um, so it's available for free on youtube.com slash playbook. And uh, it's going to have a ton of information. I really encourage people to have a look. So there's actually a science behind it. It's not just getting lucky. There is a science behind it. You have to upload once a week. You have to follow, follow trends. And you have to read that book. But this is going rather meta, isn't it? We're a YouTube channel trying to get subscribers. By the way, subscribe if you like what we're doing here. Uh, I think that's we'll... the call to arms bit that you mentioned. <laughs> there we go. One point. So, yeah, if you like what we're doing, subscribe. Uh, and then if you want to do what we're doing yourself, once you've finished watching our videos, then uh, go and create a channel, upload great stuff every week, and hopefully you'll make a success of it. You've got to have a good idea, though. That's the basis. You really of it, have really, to have a good idea, it? yeah. And it does help if you're an early upload, if you're an, an early 
a doctor. Yes. That's the channel, right? But there's still stuff that's, there's still, you know, channels out there which start and then make huge headway very quickly. There's a channel called FPS Russia. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it. See the <laughs> Rootin' Tootin' He is the Rootin' Tootin' man. Russian gunman. Hello, my friends. Uh, he started off, and I think he got a million subscribers within about three or four months, which is more than enough to make a very good living off. So there's, there's money out there if you've got a good idea. Anyway, YouTube have created a space for people. Actually, now, we're in a studio now. YouTube have created their own studio. It's not here. Nice, than <laughs> this one. And you can go there if you've got more than 10,000 subscribers and you're a partner with YouTube. And it's in central London. They've got them around the world. I think there's one in LA as well. And you can go and create your own videos. Um, so let's have a look at this. This is the YouTube Creator Space in London. The Creator Space is where your imagination and technology collide. Full broadcast quality HD cameras, professional lighting rig, dedicated green screen, audio booths, edit suites, and a state-of-the-art control room. That looks absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's a really, really nice place. I was there earlier this week and had a little tour around, and it's something else. So, I mean, if you want to create stuff, then there's, you know, YouTube will help you. They'll give you a professional studio for what, free. What was, what was, <laughs> for free? Yeah, com really? Is yeah, it yeah. Free? it's completely free to use, and they teach you all the video editing skills that you need. Absolutely astonishing. Nice. So but do you number. have to do you have to already have a following to get in? There you or? do. You have to have ten thousand subscribers, I believe, is the uh, is the number that you need before you can uh, before you can use it. What are the rest of their offices like? Because I hear it's like beanbags everywhere and ball pits and people just having fun. Have you ever had a wonderful dream where you're running through fields, sweeping your hands along daisies and poppies and wildflowers, and there's a lonely tree, and you run up, and then there's a beautiful girl. Yeah, you have that dream. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. not like that. It's no, just an okay. office. No, oh, fine. Fair enough. Most of my dreams are <laughs> really boring. They do have a beanbag. They do have a beanbag and it's good colours. They do have a beanbag. What, only one? Just a one. giant everyone one that they for, share. Everyone has to fight for it. Eric Schmidt gets first call. <laughs> anyway. When he's not in North Korea. <laughs> right, moving on. Uh, we also spoke whilst we were there to an actual YouTuber. There's a guy called uh, Steve Roberts who runs a channel called STR Skill School. It's a, it's a soccer skills channel. He basically teaches you how to do trick shots. And He's got 150,000 subscribers and about 40 million video views. So he's doing reasonably well for himself. But at that level, I tried to find out, I'll be honest, how much you earn from YouTube for doing various things. Getting an exact number is quite difficult, but he earns as much from his 150,000 subscriber YouTube channel as he does from his actual football coaching. So he's making a living out of this. Um, anyway, he told us how he got started. I released a video as a tester. It, it got a little bit of interest, but then it made me think, well, actually, is, is there something in this? So I found what I thought was a trending topic. I, I used to see uh, quite a lot of uh, Ronaldo free kick tutorials, so I decided to make that as my next video. I just basically decided to, to keep making more on the recommendations they were giving me. So, so it's kind of like, oh, can you do a skill on this? Can you show me more? So I started uploading listening to feedback. So anyone who's watching this, um, you know, they might think, you know, Steve's a football coach, he's got nothing to do with me. I think if anyone's got a, an interest or a hobby, you know, probably the people you're closest to might not be interested, but there are millions of people out there that want to know that information. So make a channel and a big advice is try and collaborate with other channels, like get in touch with like-minded people and you start sharing subscribers. And as I said, listen to the feedback you get. Because if someone doesn't like it, they're going to tell you straight away on YouTube, and they are very critical. So, when you say he does trick shots, mm. and this might be one for the older members of the audience, so I apologise. Is he a bit like the John Virgo of the football world? <laughs> well, it's actual useful football skills, I think, rather than uh, right. running it in the net from... It's not knocking one ball into a, another. Over a tree or something. Right. I don't know. Is that an impressive thing in football? I think it would be quite, quite impressive. If you could get it over. It depends how big the tree is, really. Massive. Right, yeah, no, tree. over a massive tree. Good, I'm glad we got that impressive. sorted. I'm yeah. glad we cleared that up. So anyway, if you do want to be a YouTube millionaire, it is possible, and there's far, far, far more to this interview than we can fit into this little live show. So please do check out the extended version of that piece, which is going to be going up shortly after we finish, hopefully within kind of an hour or so. And in fact, there's full-length versions of everything you've seen today going up as well. So do check that out and subscribe because we're here every Friday at four o'clock and it'll be a handy little reminder to you. Sounds like you've been listening to Google. <laughs> I, take, I take the advice. I've been listening. Um, and we've got loads of other stuff.
coming all the way through the week. Uh, I think we are planning, fingers crossed, to do something on torture on Monday. We are. Uh, not entirely sure what's happening Tuesday. It's Tuesday, um, I think we're, we're still sort of messing around with that. But the uh, the, the torture thing is we're, we're going to have a, a live debate. It's because uh, Zero Dark Thirty is going to be back in the headlines. Ah. Um, so we're having a debate on whether or not torture can ever be justified. Um, so it should be really, really interesting. We've got a couple of guests lined up already. I'm not going to tell you any more about them now, but they're very, very, very interesting. So tune back in on Monday. Amazing. And a little bit of uh, background editorial insight here. We tried to get him waterboarded <laughs> on Monday and we weren't allowed. Health and safety, unfortunately. But we'll try and CGI it somehow. I, I actually asked for that to happen as well and, <laughs> and I got shut down. It's pretty horrible though. I mean, people, if, if you do want to see it, uh, you can find videos of people trying it on YouTube and it's, it's pretty unpleasant. It's not something that I would really yeah. want to go through. Well, yeah, it's not something I really wanted to go through, but, you know, it's, it, it would be an interesting story to tell your friends down the pub. It? it is, and it's something that we really wanted well, you to go through. While you're drinking responsibly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was really keen for it to happen, including me, and it's not. There we go. On our Wednesday, Wednesday is our uh, best of the week selection where we look at all the stories that we haven't been able to look at elsewhere. Uh, funny things, sad things, amazing things, so do tune in for that. And, um, of course, we'll take your comments and suggestions there. Thursday? Thursday is our big debate. debate. Uh, not entirely sure what that one is yet, but we'll come back to you. We'll find out in the description. And on Friday, we're back to investigate, and the whole thing goes round in a great big circle of life. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I thought you were, yeah. <laughs> were going to crack out into song then. <laughs> uh, I was. On, please, do it. There you go. In the jungle, the mighty jungle. That's enough. Right. Zebras. And from there, <laughs> neatly segueing. Brilliant segue. <laughs> Brilliant. Swish. <laughs> neatly segueing into horse meat because. You can't help but have noticed if you are in the UK, again, if you're not in the UK, please look this up because it's hilarious. Uh, horse meat is back on the menu. Um, <laughs> Without say, anybody menu, knowing it. In the news. These are horse burgers. <laughs> Apparently they're not horse burgers. Uh, but it's been found in beef lasagna. And this beef lasagna has been found to be 100% horse meat. <laughs> How did that ever <laughs> now, this, this is a scandal that broke a couple of weeks ago. The burgers that came out a couple of weeks ago, they were 10, 15% horse meat absolute tops. They found a beef lasagna, very clearly labelled as beef lasagna, with zero beef. <laughs> it's no beef. <laughs> slight, slight misprint there on the, uh, on, on the packaging. You know, H, O, R, S and E are very close to B, E, E and F on a keyboard. There's one of the letters is the same. It is it's the just same. not in the same place. It's an easy mistake to make. They live on farms in fields. They all have four legs <laughs> and they all taste absolutely delicious anyway the thing, they probably they probably do but they're going to get thrown away they're going to get wasted it's going to be a terrible waste uh, of food meat, because horse meat's really tasty <laughs> there are allegations however which the company have refuted uh, but they are checking into it because there were allegations initially that there were some quite nasty chemicals in the in those horses as well companies denied it and uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll be absolutely fine i'll have a little investigation anyway Horse meat finding its way back onto British selves for the <laughs> second time in uh, in two weeks. Delicious horse meat. You just can't probably put it down. improved the burgers. <laughs> can't comment on the lasagna, but I'm sure it improved the burgers. Delicious. Anyway, next week on Truth Loader, we'll be trying horse meat or cannelloni, as it's <laughs> better known. A lovely, lovely chili. Right. <laughs> Go out, try it. It's delicious. Horse meat, honestly, brilliant. Anyway. Uh, We've not really had any comments today, unfortunately, so we're just going to move swiftly on and call it a day. I think yeah. it's been a technical disaster, but we've had a lot of fun. Anyway, we're going to play out on some music today. Is so... James Pope in the video? Hmm? Is he's, James Pope... he's not, unfortunately. Oh. You saw a brief glimpse of him in the corner. And, you know and what he looks he's like. Gone. Now you know what James Pope looks like. So hopefully we'll have him back maybe next week. We'll uh, invite him back and we'll sort out some technical problems and we'll have a little conversation with uh, James Pope. So if you do, again, have any questions, keep on sending them in and we'll try and get them sorted next week. But before we go, last, well, three weeks ago, we had uh, a couple of featured vloggers. One of them was called Gwen Barringer and her husband is called Sean Decker. Um, last night, we had a debate on computer gaming and whether or not it's addictive. Um, and Sean was watching and he decided to send me a video that he created, which um, we'll, we'll play you in a minute. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, he sent it because he said that he is addicted to Halo. 
Um, and I had a big conversation with him on Twitter about it because I watched it first. The, the, the video is based around the thing called victory crouching, which looks a lot more sexual than yes. the name suggests. Uh, I was trying to have a little drink then, and uh, someone made me a cup of tea earlier, but it appears that I've only got the tea bag. Hmm. Anyway, so I had a big conversation with Sean on Twitter last night, and um, he... <laughs> visual humour. <laughs> visual humour. Yeah. It's a visual pun. Um, anyway, speaking to Sean, I think that the song sounds a little bit like uh, the sort of love child of Kraftwerk and Joy Division, and he was pretty pleased with that. <laughs> um, if they what were into comparison. games. What a comparison. If, in, instead of autobahns. Games instead of autobahns. <laughs> and... Um, but he said, he said he saw the song more as a sort of modern day, we are the champions. And it's one, every time you win, <laughs> you're going to just rub salt in the wounds of the people that you're playing against. So um, we, this is an edited down version of it. It's absolutely brilliant. We're going to have a little dance as it plays out. This um, deserves to be a viral hit. If you don't go home whistling this to yourself, then you aren't human and weren't listening. <laughs> and the full link will be in the caption. Right. This is it.